which is impacting every facet of all of our lives. Tonight, we are joined by local experts to focus on whole child wellness and provide information and tools to help parents and caregivers during these stressful times. We will end tonight's presentation with a Q&A session. Please submit your questions through the comment section on this Facebook Live feed. Please note that our panelists cannot answer child-specific questions related to health or school-specific questions. Our panelists include Dr. Stacy Furlow with Northwest Arkansas Pediatrics. Dr. Furlow is a board-certified pediatrician and has been part of NWA Pediatrics since 2000. She has a degree in microbiology and has long been interested in infectious disease. She has followed COVID-19 with a great professional interest. She is also a strong supporter of preventative medicine, particularly in using nutrition to prevent lifestyle diseases. Dr. Furlow is a native of Northwest Arkansas and enjoys reading, cooking, and exploring national parks with her husband, an internal medicine physician, and her four children, ages 13 to 21. She also loves Razorback baseball. Our next presenter is Jamie Frela, a lecturer of psychology at the University of Arkansas. Dr. Jamie Frela teaches developmental psychology and abnormal psychology at the U of A. As a mother of four children ranging from age two to 10, she knows the messiness and uncertainty of parenthood, especially during the times of upheaval that we are all in right now. Dr. Freyla earned her MA in clinical psychology and a PhD in experimental psychology from the University of Arkansas. Our next presenter is Justin Minkle, a teacher at Jones Elementary School. Justin Minkle has been a teacher for 20 years. He has taught first, second, and third grades at Jones Elementary School in Springdale since 2004. And his honors include becoming the 2007 Arkansas Teacher of the Year, a National Board Certified Teacher, and a 2015 inductee into the Fayetteville Public Education Foundation's Hall of Honor. He writes a monthly column for Education Week Teacher and started the Home Library Effect, a project to put books into the hands and homes of children living in poverty, which grew from his own 25 students to impact over 7,000 children in Northwest Arkansas and across the country. Justin is a dad to Aiden and Ariana, ages 9 and 12, and they attend Fayetteville Public Schools. Our next presenter is John Thompson, owner of TLC Tutoring Company. Mr. Thompson is the co-owner of TLC Tutoring and director of the TLC Community Foundation. He holds a BA in political science from Arkansas State University and is currently pursuing a master's in business administration at Louisiana State University. Mr. Thompson is an accomplished public speaker and panelist speaking on a range of topics from intersectionality to education. He is a three-time International Public Debate Association national champion, the former Arkansas Boys State Governor, and an active member of his fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. He and his wife have a three-year-old daughter. And helping me tonight from the Fayetteville Public Library are members of the Youth Services staff, librarians Gina Clay, Emily Jones, and Stacy Mitchell. Thank you guys all for being here tonight. And first, we will hear from Dr. Stacy Furlow. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Dr. Furlow. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm going to just talk for a few minutes uh, with a little summary of things that um, I say a bunch of times every day to parents in the office. Um, and I'm just going to start with the first slide, which is just a good foundation of health. And these are things that we should do pretty much every day, whether you're a year old, whether you're 99 years old. Um, and that is to just have, uh, I always say there's like three legs of a stool um, that are your basic uh, legs of health. And I added a fourth one there because sometimes you exercise inside and you still need to go out and get fresh air and sunshine. So nutrition is the number one thing. 
we want to eat really a plant-based diet. Um, you want to limit your sugar, your processed foods, anything that's packaged and will last for a significant length of time in your house. You really want to limit that to maybe once a day, every few days, um, and drink plenty of water. Um, this is going to set you up to just have a nice, healthy lifestyle. And if you do get sick, it will hopefully help minimize your symptoms. Um, sleep, of course, is based on age. Young children, you know, if they're under four or five, need between 12 and 14 hours of sleep a day. That decreases in school age children to somewhere between nine and 11 based on the individual child. And then when you're a teenager, you really need to make sure those teenagers are getting a minimum of nine hours of sleep a day. If they can get 10, that's ideal, but sometimes that's a little bit difficult, especially if you have a high school student who has a zero hour and they've got homework and activities, that kind of thing. But if you can really make a nine hour minimum for those high school students, um, they'll be getting plenty of sleep. And we know that sleep really affects our immune system. We need to exercise every day. Um, preferably for an hour, five days a week. Um, a lot of, of older kids get that just by being involved in uh, school sports. Um, but if your child is not involved in an activity where they really get a lot of exercise, make sure that they get outside and play. It doesn't have to be organized, but just, you know, getting out, getting a little bit sweaty, a little bit dirty, um, really makes a difference in the way that their body works in an effective manner. Um, and then fresh air and sunshine. We need our vitamin D. We need fresh air. Um, we need, outdoor activities right now are obviously perfect and wonderful because of the good weather, except for today. Um, and so really take advantage of, of the fall in Arkansas and get outside. You can turn to the next slide. Um, here's some things that I think um, can be helpful. I've implemented in my own family and um, I'm recommending to my friends and my patients about talking to kids through this situation. So the most important thing I think we can do with our kids anytime we're dealing with something difficult, particularly right now, is age appropriate honesty. Obviously what you tell a four-year-old is not the same thing you talk to with a 16-year-old and and those are pretty extreme examples, but even within, you know, you may have an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old, and even within those two children, one may be able to understand things a little bit more than the other, um, take into account their personality types, and, um, and really just talk to them and, and be honest about what's going on. And no one is serviced by, um, you know, funny little stories about what's going on that are, that are not straightforward. Um, kids, kids, kids can suss out your deception pretty quickly um, and it makes them nervous and it makes them feel insecure and if they can't ask their parents about what's going on. They're not really sure who they can ask. And so um, being honest is super important. Um, and then avoid making promises to your children about when there's going to be a vaccine, when this is going to be over, when they can go back to normal school situations, or when their favorite activity is going to come, come back. Um, right now, anybody who can promise you any time frame, I, I would go talk to somebody else. Nobody knows. And um, we, we have vague ideas, but really, uh, the disappointment that we feel when timelines come and go uh, without a resolution to this make us all frustrated and kids feel that as well. Um, you can model resilience and try to and help build that into your own children by uh, being resilient yourself and let them see that. Um, it's okay for them to see that um, you may be frustrated and then talk through that with your kid about how you're dealing with that, how you're dealing with disappointments, but how you're also looking forward and, and thinking about things positively in the future. Um, and holding things loosely, you know, we all have plans that have fallen apart this, this year. Um, we may have some plans in the next year that fall apart. Uh, visits to grandparents, trips you have planned, uh, birthday celebrations, all kinds of things that are just not happening or are certainly happening differently. And, and it, when kids see you modeling that, then they don't get their heart set on things either. And then trying to keep the long view, realizing that this, while it feels like it's been forever some days and some days it feels like it hasn't been, it's kind of a time warp. Just remember that this will end and keep your eye on the horizon and, and remember that things will get back to some semblance of normal at some point in the future. And then take the time to enjoy the margins you have in your life right now that you may not have had 
previously, you know, that it's, I've found a lot of joy in just having a lot of weekend time with my family. My husband's built a lot of things. He's found new hobbies, you know, help your children realize that every second of the day doesn't have to be packed. Every weekend doesn't have to have something special. Um, there's really a lot to be said for uh, downtime and the extra space we have um, in our lives. And it's a great time to try something new, pick up a new hobby, um, try a new activity with your family, learn to cook, grow a garden, um, all kinds of things. Card games, my boys have learned how to play poker. Um, we've done lots of jigsaw puzzles. So just, you know, talk to your friends, find things that are new um, for your kids to try. And then just modeling a family model of wellness. Your kids are much more likely to uh, be willing to eat their fruits and vegetables, beans and grains, go outside and get sweaty when they see you doing the same thing. If you're eating nacho cheese Doritos and asking them to eat some green beans, they're not gonna be uh, very into that. So um, when, you, when they see you doing all the same things that you're asking of them, uh, then they're gonna join in and, and follow along with you. Um, and that even goes for teenagers. Um, and then just make sure you're giving yourself plenty of grace the others around you giving them plenty of grace. Um, you know, we all have good days and bad days and right now people are frustrated and they're, they're sad and um, they may be grieving and it's really important to just look around and just offer grace. When in doubt, don't be offended, just offer somebody some love and some support. Um, and my favorite place to get uh, COVID information is actually a, a, um, podcast called Sidrap, C-I-D-R-A-P, um, and it's a guy named Michael Ulsterholm, who y'all may have seen um, on TV and being interviewed, and he is my, my favorite place to get information and has been throughout this whole pandemic, and he, he calls this our COVID year, and he says, you just have to get your brain around the idea that we're going to have a COVID year, and I think he's it's a great thing to hang on to. I say it frequently. Um, this is our COVID year, and we'll look back and we'll talk about it. You can go to the next slide. Uh, these are just some supplies I think everybody ought to have in their house at the moment. Um, they're good, it's nothing crazy. You'll use these later on uh, as well, but keep um, a supply of your favorite healthy foods that, that way you're not stuck on takeout or on, dependent on other people um, if you were to get sick and need to stay home for a couple of weeks with your family. Um, electrolyte solutions are wonderful. Um, you can get little packets that you can mix into water or you can get pre-mixed pre Pedialyte um, or Gatorade. Um, and then have a, a working thermometer every single day. At least half of my patients tell me their thermometer doesn't work. So uh, whether it's a forehead scanner or a, you know, just a regular oral thermometer, you, any, just a thermometer so you can monitor your temperature or your child's temperature. A pulse ox is a great thing to have at the house. And um, I, I know they were hard to come by for a little bit, but I saw a bunch at the Walgreens at Mission and Crossover last weekend. So I know they're back in stock. Um, it's a great thing to have to monitor your oxygenation and, and be able to communicate with your physician about whether or not you need to seek out more intense medical care. And then fever reducers such as Tylenol or ibuprofen, you do not want to use um, aspirin in anybody under age 18 with a fever for the risk of rise syndrome. So make sure you have Tylenol and ibuprofen available in both liquid and pill forms. And then a humidifier may be a really helpful thing to have in your house to use in a bedroom uh, just to help with uh, getting, uh, thinning out mucus, and then also just for cough and runny nose and, and the discomfort that goes along with that. And that's all I have. Thank you so much, Dr. Frelo. Uh, next, we will hear from Dr. Frela. Hi there. Um, I'm going to be talking today about some tools to navigate our kids' mental health during the difficult season. We can start by talking about some, what is behavioral and mental health broadly. The emotional, psychological, you can go on to the next slide, to the emotional, psychological, and social well-being. Obviously, the other side to mental health is mental illness, which are conditions that affect a person's thinking, feeling, mood, or behavior. These exist um, on a spectrum that vary across individuals in time, and we obviously all came into the pandemic with kind of a baseline of mental health or mental illness. 
about one in five children pre-pandemic, either at that moment or at some point during their life, will have a seriously debilitating mental illness. And there's reason to suggest that COVID um, is putting this a little bit on the rise as we add stress to our lives. Next slide. I'm gonna be focusing though this talk primarily on the ways that um, mental health rather than the mental illness. I will touch on a few red flags at the end, but I'm gonna be mostly focusing on the significant ups and downs that our fam families are experiencing during this time of COVID. Research tells us that uncertainty and uncontrollability are two of the primary factors that can really exacerbate um, mental health concerns. And is or that COVID year is nothing if not uncertain and uncontrollable. For a lot of us, including myself too, the negative emotions that have been brought on by the pandemic really can't be separated from those that have been brought on by the fight for social justice. And the pandemic has really intensified all of these pre-existing inequalities. So it's really important that we use these feelings as information about how to proceed and where to focus in trying to make ourselves um, more stable and inserting areas of control. Our kids are having all sorts of negative emotions during this pandemic. Some of those are frustration. They're frustrated or angry that they can't go to the sports practice, that they can't see their grandparents, that they can't go out with their friends or see their girlfriend or boyfriend, depending on the age. Those sometimes to us seem like little things, but they really for our kids were a cornerstone of their world. They're experiencing an enormous amount of sadness um, some of that is in the form of grief. Some of that might be grief at the actual loss of a loved one. And some of those might be just the loss of touching base with um, someone that they loved, like a teacher, a coach, being able to see or hug their grandparents or aunts and uncles or cousins on a regular basis. Those losses are real and um, our kids don't always know how to process that or name those emotions in the same way we do. Obviously, sadness extends all the way to depression. And if you think your child is experiencing actual clinical depression, I would encourage you to seek help. I'll provide some mental health resources at the end. Um, but if you think that this is crossed out of sort of what we could consider normal for a COVID year grief, um, tune into that. Loneliness can be so real during this pandemic. And I think for our kids, it's even more pronounced because we are physically present with them so much more than we ever have been, and yet also really emotionally unavailable at a lot of times. I'm sitting with them, but I'm also on my computer. I'm emailing from my phone, but I'm also helping them do school. And so it can be harder for us adults to separate that home and work life, um, which leads to more loneliness for our kids, even though we feel like we're with them all the time. The shame and guilt is really present right now, um, is really run amok for adults, where there were no good choices, there was no clear options that would be great, and a lot of shame and guilt has gone with those, and that's trickling down to our kids, who might start to understand that they are um, sort of part of that burden, that the child care and the, all the responsibilities that go with our kids are creating a lot of stress for us as adults. Um, and so it's important to sort of make sure that they feel connected and that they aren't sort of the source of our um, burden. The fear and anxiety for kids is really um, a, a lot more than us. Um, we think that we have a heavy burden, but you think about the uncertainty and uncontrollability that they have is so much more than us. They aren't in charge of the decisions of whether or not they go to school or which family we see, or do we invite the grandparents or do we travel for Thanksgiving? And so that uncertainty and uncontrollability for them is really enhancing their fear and anxiety. They might not understand how the, how the virus is transmitted or who is sort of poses a threat to them or who they pose a threat to. So being able to take the time to really explain to them in age appropriate language um, what is going on um, is important as an ongoing conversation. I underline boredom here as a negative emotion because it's certainly experienced as a negative emotion, but I highlight it here because it's really an opportunity, particularly for kids, 
to have a lot of um, creativity, new activities to really bloom out of that. Being able to tolerate boredom and then find something on one's own to do is really part of the task of childhood. And we see a lot of adults don't handle that well. And so I wouldn't necessarily say that that's the same type of a negative emotion. You can go on to the next slide. With those negative emotions, we really want to feel those feelings. Our, our role as a caregiver is not to prevent all these feelings. It's not to fix them. What is our role? Primarily our role is to listen, to listen to our kids in all sorts of ways, to absorb their negative emotions, to let them tell us how much they miss school, their friends, their activities, their grandparents going to the store and shopping, how frustrated they are with their mask, without having to respond in a heavy way, right? That, that it just is, that this is part of the way it, that life is during um, the COVID year, as um, our previous speaker named it, and listening to them all the way through. Helping them name their feelings can be so incredibly important for both little kids and also adolescents. Being able to, to help them identify that what they're feeling isn't so much anger, but is really jealousy. That your family has perhaps set different boundaries than another family. That as we get older, there's that fear of missing out. Is it fear? Is it anxiety? Are they really just bored and they're not hungry, right? Being able to identify those feelings helps give kids control over those feelings. I separate talking and sort of facilitation here as two separate points, but really they become all one point. If you think back to when you were a kid, um, or even now, no one really likes to sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk. To get our kids talking, we need to be able to play in some way. For little kids, that looks like sitting down on the floor, playing dragons or Barbies or whatever it is that they like to do, coloring together. For older kids, maybe that's playing basketball, going on a bike ride, doing a puzzle, and talking through those things, even a car ride. Some of the most meaningful conversations we have are while we're doing, we're, we're doing a task in a co-constructed sort of way. I list journaling here, and we think about journaling sometimes as an independent activity, but particularly for our adolescents, this can be um, a shared activity. And so being able to start a notebook where you perhaps pose some questions to your adolescent or write some of your feelings about the day and then leave it on their pillow so that they can respond um, in their own time and in their own way and perhaps pose some questions to you back as well in which you'll open up to them. That can go back and forth a couple times a week and can really facilitate some of the open lines of communication with adolescents that can be hard to do during that season of their lives. We can go on to the next slide. Positive emotions um, can exist alongside negative emotions. We're going to talk a little bit about cultivating positive emotions, but I want to be clear that we're not trying to cover up or replace those negative emotions. A lot of times we just need to feel both and that two things can be true at the same time. We can be having a fun day and really miss that normally Thursday nights were soccer nights or something. Um, gratitude. Cultivating a gratitude practice in your family um, can be helpful not during a pandemic, but also particularly during a pandemic, finding the things that we are grateful for. For example, this week our water heater has been out, so we've been taking um, very fast and cold showers, but we've been, I've been saying out loud to my kids how glad I am that I can turn on the tap, that clean, safe drinking water comes out whenever I want it to. Finding the things about our situation that we can um, grasp onto. A lot of times at dinner, we'll go around and say something that we're grateful for that day or just in our life. And it can be something that semi-regularly families can do to help kids um, sort of center into what's right now. Adding fun and laughter into your life. Sometimes um, I get so busy parenting my kids and making sure that they've eaten and done school and all the things that we have to do, we forget to have fun and laughter. This can be watching a show or sitcom together, playing border card games, sitting down and playing their favorite video game with them. I can't stand Minecraft and my kids love it. And I, on a regular basis, try to sit down and engage with them about that. Little kids a lot of times require us to go outside of our comfort zones and quack like a duck or stomp like an elephant. 
Um, you can do a joke of the day. My husband has a death calendar and he'll bring down the joke of the day to dinner and we'll tell it. Sometimes it lands, sometimes it goes over their head, um, but it's a way to introduce some laughter. Things like dance parties or Cosmic Kids Yoga can introduce creativity or physical movement into your day. Um, exercise and being outside really helps us feel better, but sometimes we have to like kind of force ourselves to do it. This is true with kids too. Sometimes it's easier for them to pick up the iPad or to do the indoor thing, but if we can force them outside, then they can get that sunshine, they can move around, and um, it certainly makes our day go better and my kids fight less when I um, push them outside some. And control, inserting control into their life wherever we can. This isn't always possible, but can they have a friend over, but everybody wears a mask and you stay outside? Can they pick up the phone and FaceTime grandma whenever they want to without necessarily having to go through you? Can they choose, be part of choosing what's for dinner or choosing what activities you guys do each night? Picking movies, things like that. Any way to insert control into their lives. We can go on to the next slide. Managing, their, managing behavior ends up being why people come in um, to get help. And I covered emotions on, pur on purpose because, on, first on purpose, because behavior is almost always an outcropping of our emotions. Managing our be kids' behavior really varies greatly by age, so I'm not gonna be super specific about it, but we wanna clearly identify and describe the behavior that we're having a problem with. Are they throwing a tantrum? Are they throwing things? Are they biting things? Are they using apps or social media in a way that is out of bounds for older kids? Are they having um, an attitude problem or not doing their chores? Identify and describe that behavior so that you know what we are actually trying to change. Try to understand what's causing that behavior. I have a saying that I use, hungry, tired, lonely, scared, bored. And whenever my kids are acting out, I try to say that in my head first before I react. Are they hungry, tired, lonely, scared, bored? Obviously, hungry and tired have physical causes, and so you have to sort of meet those needs. You can't reason through them, you just have to meet them. I have one kid who tends to get hangry, and my kids know when she starts screaming, they should get her a cheese stick. Um, the other ones, though, need to be tackled in other ways and might require the um, caregiver to be a little bit creative. What does the behavior help the child achieve? That can help us meet the, the goal of the child in identifying alternative acceptable behaviors. Are they throwing a fit because you're on the computer and you're plugged into work? Can you spend 10 minutes before you have to sit down to work to really fill that love cup? Can you go play with them or sit down on the floor and be all in and then say when the timer goes off, it's time to, for mom to go to work or dad to go to work? Can you identify acceptable behaviors? Are they using a social media app that's out of bounds? Is there some way that they can interact more with their friends? Are they throwing rocks? Well, maybe they can throw balls or maybe they can throw rocks over the fence, right? We can find things that they can do. Next slide. I can't emphasize how much the adults matter too. Almost always when um, families and children come in, a lot of times in addition to what might be needed for the child, the adult needs support. COVID has really weakened all of our support systems and it's reduced our resources, but multiplied our stress. And so sometimes what we need is the adult needs therapy more than the child. We need to have some outlet for our emotions. We need to be able to engage in some of these self-care behaviors. To take five minutes between when you shut your laptop at night, but before you walk out to deal with your kids so that you can transition from work mode to home mode. Can you find ways that can put life back in perspective for you. The next few slides here, we're gonna click through fairly quickly. They're um, identifying red flags and I've included them because in the handouts that the library will provide you, you'll be able to look through these more carefully to see if your child has any of these red flags. They vary greatly by age and by illness, but really broadly, if we have any extreme or unusual behaviors, any sudden or unexpected negative changes, we want to um, consider some professional help. Next slide. These are some specific red flags that you can also find on the Association for Children's Mental Health website. You can click to the next one. And then the one after that. Anytime that there's self-injury, 
um, talk of suicide or actual violence though, it's important that you take immediate action in terms of seeking help and take that incredibly seriously. Next slide. Here's a few resources. Again, these will be included in the slides provided by the library of some places that you might start. This is obviously not a comprehensive list of mental health resources in our area, but a good place to get started in connecting your children, adolescents, or you to get some professional help that you might need. The final slide, I um, welcome questions and discussions about um, things that I might have missed or ways this is impacting your life. Thank All you right. so much, Dr. Frayla. Our next presenter will be Justin Minkle. Justin. So the first thing I want to say to all the parents out there is that you're doing a better job than you think you are. And parenting is a lot like teaching in that it's just too hard and complicated to feel like you're crushing it all the time. And I think that's especially true for moms. You know, I think moms still in our culture tend to do most of the childcare, tend to do most of the cleaning, and get blamed when things go wrong, but don't get a lot of credit when things go right. I think the good news is that I've been a teacher for about 20 years, and mostly I've been with kids of color, kids who live in poverty, and they deal with all kinds of hard things in their lives. And my biggest takeaway after 20 years, which I added up the other day to be over 10,000 hours with kids, is that kids can come through all kinds of things as long as they know they're loved. You know, they can get through loss, they can get through grief, they can get through divorce, they can get through trauma and poverty and racism, and they'll get through COVID as long as they know that there's someone there who loves them. And you're doing that for them just by being there. And I think it's easy to underestimate how important it is just that you're there, that you show up every day, that you don't leave and abandon your kids, even when it's really, really hard. Um, they really feel that presence. And it's, the most important thing you can give them. I think it's the greatest gift. Um, can we go to the next slide, please, Gina? These are my own kids. Um, this is when they were younger. Right now they're nine and 12. And when they were born, I realized that my job as a teacher had a lot to do with my job as a dad. And it in some ways simplified it. I realized that really what I want for my kids is for them to be happy and for them to be good people. And I think sometimes when things get so complicated, like right now, especially for those of us who are doing distance learning and are trying to keep track of the reading log and the Lexia minutes and what they're supposed to be doing for their PE log and art class, it can get so scattered that it's good to kind of go back to what you're doing each day as a dad, as a mom, and think, is this helping my kids be happier? And is it helping them be better people? And kind of to go back to what I said a minute ago, you know, I think kids can be okay through really hard things, but that doesn't mean that they don't go through really hard times. And so it's okay if your kids are struggling sometimes right now. Um, there's a line I really like, the storm doesn't hurt the sky. And the idea is that the storm is all those hard emotions, you know, that Dr. Fraley just talked about. But the children are the sky, you know, we are the sky and we'll be okay. Those hard feelings pass through and we're still okay after that. I'm going to go to the next slide, please, Gina. I want to tell a story about something that happened about halfway into our pandemic six months we've experienced to my son. Um, he was running through the kitchen door and he turned and put his hand on the glass to push it shut and fractured the pane of glass, badly lacerated his arm. And he just started sobbing, not because it hurt, but because he was so scared that we'd be exposed to COVID if we had to go into urgent care, or we had to go into the emergency room. And what happened that night is we had one of the most meaningful conversations we've ever had. You know, every night we talk when I tuck him in and we talked for about an hour that night. And I realized that physical pain had unleashed all kinds of things going on with him. So he talked about how worried he was about his friends going to camps that they might get COVID. He said, you know, I'm really worried about my babysitter. She's my only grown up friend and she's going to have a baby and she'll have to go to the hospital. And so he was worried about her and the baby getting COVID. Um, it was right after the murder of George Floyd. He said, you know, I keep thinking about that. Even though he hadn't seen the video, you know, he knew what had happened. We talked him through it. And he said, I just keep thinking about how awful that is. Um, so all these things came up and it was kind of like what Dr. Freyla said. I feel like most of what I did was just really listen. <laughs> you know, once in a while I'd ask a question, but I mostly listened. And again, you know, the storm doesn't hurt the sky. He got through it, you know, that night and we kind of made some action plans of what he could do the next day. You know, the next day he did a Skype with one of his friends. He talked on, you know, his, the iPhone for about an hour with his babysitter who he hadn't talked to in a long time. Um, and, you know, and he said that night before he drifted off to sleep, he said, you know, I think there's a heaven and I think that George Floyd is there. So he got through it. And can we go to the next slide, please, Gina? 
And so what that taught me was, first of all, that our kids are going through a lot that's kind of beneath the surface sometimes that we don't realize. And I don't think they realize. I mean, if you'd looked at him before he hurt his arm that day, he was playing kickball in the yard with his sister and running around making a bike course. Um, and it kind of took that physical pain to unlock all this stuff that was going on beneath the surface that he wasn't even aware of. And so to me, this kind of says there are three things that are really important for us to do as moms, as dads. And the first one, again, is just your presence, just really being there. Um, that's one thing that I've realized, you know, as a teacher, is that the most important thing I do is what's happening in this photo, just really giving that focused time one-on-one. -on -one. And I think it's one of the things that's hard for teachers right now is when you're trying to do that with 25 kids or 150 kids at junior high, high school, um, it's really hard to have that one-on-one -on -one time. And that's how kids learn. I think that's how kids heal. And, and we can do that as parents. Uh, when we do what Dr. Frayla said, you know, just really give them that focus. Um, you know, when my dad was around us as a kid, he'd spend a lot of time in a chair in the corner of the living room doing the crossword or reading a book. And he was always available. If we wanted to go talk to him, he'd immediately put down the book or crossword and give us his full attention. And he said later that that was really intentional, you know, that he wasn't right there on top of us all the time and he wasn't kind of intruding in our play or our conversations, but if we needed him, he was there. And I think that presence, again, is the greatest gift that we can give our kids through this really hard time. Can we go to the next slide, please, Gina. So the second piece of advice I would give really goes back to what Dr. Furlow said, talking about kind of being honest with kids, but in an appropriate way. And the greatest person in history at this, I think, was Mr. Rogers, who talked about really hard things like the assassination of Robert Kennedy. Um, and he did it in a way that was honest with kids, but also thinking about where they were. And the best piece of advice I think he gave was to look for the helpers. Um, you know, I was teaching in New York City um, when September 11th happened. And even in that kind of awful tragedy, we saw all these helpers, you know, we saw the first responders. And we see that now with COVID, you know, we see medical workers who are going in, you know, like Dr. Furlow, like nurses um, who are going into these really scary situations to serve people. And the same thing with teachers. Teachers are the helpers right now, you know, and I don't think that they should have to be in the situation they're in, but they're going in every day and doing the best they can for the kids in their care. Um, and so, the second thing I would say that you can take that even further is that kids can actually be the helpers and sometimes that's really powerful for them. I think when they're going through a hard time, sometimes we want to shield them from it, but sometimes it actually helps them more to find out ways that they can actually help, you know, and kind of channel some of that anxiety they're feeling into action the same way that adults can sometimes. So one of my students, you know, about three weeks into distance learning back in March, had a bunch of questions about the pandemic. And one of the things I told her was, you know, you're being a helper right now just by trying to be really careful, um, trying to stay home and not kind of give this to especially old people. And we talked about some other ways that there are helpers all over the world right now, working on a vaccine, you know, working on treatments. Um, and so I think it can really help kids realize that there's that goodness that always rises to meet moments like this. And can we go to the next slide, please, Gina? You know, the other thing, um, and, and again, I think Dr. Fraley mentioned this earlier, is to practice gratitude. Um, this guy right here who was on Oprah is a happiness expert, which I think we could all use right now. And I heard him speak last year, and there were a couple things that really hit me that he said. The big one was that we are processing too much every day in our lives to meaningfully focus and process all of it. Too much is just streaming over us. And when you count kind of social media and news and, and the way that that adds to that flood, it's really true. And so we've got to be really careful and kind of curate what we take in the same way we're careful about what we eat and drink and put into our bodies. Um, and so that means for one thing, kind of being thoughtful about the news. You know, I always realize my kids are listening anytime NPR is on. Sometimes I have to stop a story that maybe they're not ready for. You know, I have to pay attention to what kind of news my daughter is kind of consuming on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think we have to know what's going on, but for me, it's always about, you know, kind of finding that balance where we know enough to be taking action, to be good citizens and help the world, but not so much that it gets completely overwhelming. Um, and you know, the other idea he had is really just focusing on what we're grateful for. So in my classroom, we'd start the morning a lot of times just with a few kids sharing what they're grateful for and they'd tell their partner. Um, our family does that, you know, every night over the dinner table and we just kind of talk about things we're grateful for. And it might be trivial, you know, it might be that there's this really delicious ice cream bar that the kid's going to eat in 20 minutes after dinner, but ice cream can get you through a lot, you know, like sometimes it's stuff like that. Other times it's people in our lives that we're grateful for, um, but just kind of learning to pay attention to that. And, and I heard a speaker talk about the news and said, you know, it's important to stay abreast of the news, but the media is really designed to talk about terrible things that happen once in a while. And they kind of neglect or skip over all the good things and all the kind of human decency and goodness that happens every single day. So it's important to kind of look for those things and realize how much good is in the world along with the hard parts. Go to the next slide, please, Gina. 
This is a good friend of mine who is the Texas and National Teacher of the Year 2015. And the biggest piece of advice she gives teachers is a piece of advice that I think can help parents to just find some time to journal. It doesn't have to be every day, but even a couple times a week. And maybe when the kids are in bed. And think about these three things. You know, what do you do well as a parent, as a person? Uh, what do you need to work on? And then what are your next steps, kind of your immediate next steps? And I think it's a way to take all this complexity that's happening and, and be reflective, but in a way that's not sort of overwhelming. Next slide, please. I wanted to give you a few different resources that I think are great for parents. Uh, this one you can get for free for 30 days. I'm not sure how much it is after that, but it's skidepic.com has all kinds of digital read alouds that kids can have either read to them or they can follow along themselves, but it's just this huge digital library. Um, next slide. There's also the New York Times at home supplement that is specifically for parents who are kind of trying not to go crazy within the confines of their house. And it's really practical, you know, it's things about like great snacks you can make or activities that kids can do or art projects that really just require newspaper and tape. Um, so that can be a great resource too. Next slide. We Need Diverse Books is really important, I think, and I think it's important for kids of color, but also for white students or majority culture students. Um, it also has a good selection of, you know, people who are neurodiverse or LGBTQ families. And you know, the publishing industry for children, I think, has kind of woken up. Um, in 2005, they did a big survey and found that of the main characters in books, about 76% were white, 8% were African American, 5% were a combination of Latino or Asian American or indigenous, and then 12% were like talking animals. And so basically, if you were a child of color, you know, you had less a chance of seeing yourself in a book than you would if you were, you know, a talking truck. Um, and so this is a great catalog if you're really trying to bring those diverse books into your home. Um, just today, my son was telling me, you know, I really like this book because it has so many characters of color and he came over and he showed me all the different people in it. Next slide, please, Gina. And then if you want to read my column, I write one roughly every month. If you just Google Justin Minkle Edweek Teacher, um, the main audience is teachers, but it also has a lot of overlap for parents. And that's especially true right now when so many parents have suddenly become their child's teacher to some extent. Um, so this is a piece I wrote in March about the pandemic. Um, there's some others on there too that you can just find if you Google it. Next slide. And then I kind of wanted to end on this idea that we will get through this. The reason I included this kind of wall of the University of Arkansas at the bottom is that I grew up here, you know, third grade on, and it never really hit me until James Carville came and spoke at the university um, right during the Iraq war. And he said, you know, this university was founded in 1871 what had just happened, you know? We just had a civil war that ended in 1865. You know, the South was on the losing side of that. The nation was completely in tatters. And he just talked about what optimism and hope it took for someone to say, I'm going to found an institution of higher learning in this country that almost split apart. Um, so we've been through really hard times and we can get through those again. The book that I have up here is by Jane Yolen, who wrote Owl Moon. And it's not out yet, it's coming out in October, but I got to hear kind of a preview of it and she read the book at a children's writers conference. And the idea of the book is perfect for the pandemic, even though it doesn't directly address COVID. Um, and it talks about these natural disasters and it says, you know, when the hurricane came, when the wildfires came, here's what my family did, like how they got safe, how they got through it, and also what they did to do what Mr. Rogers said and really be helpers to others. Um, and then at the end, it always says, you know, hurricanes are powerful, I'm powerful too. Wildfires are powerful. I'm powerful too. So, you know, you are powerful as a parent. Your children are powerful. And we'll get through this. We'll get to the other side. Can I go to the last slide, please, Gina? <laughs> so I just wanted to thank you. If you want to look on Twitter, um, that's where I kind of put these columns. Um, but the kind of final thought I wanted to leave you with is a line from Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, and he said, we're all here to help each other get through this thing, whatever it is. And I think that's what we're all doing right now. And it's uncharted territory, but we're all helping each other get through it. And we're going to keep doing that until we get to the other side of this pandemic and all these hard times. So thank you for listening. I'm glad to answer questions later and I'll turn it over to JJ next. Justin. All right, JJ. Well, hello everybody. Thank you for having me on tonight. Uh, my name is JJ Thompson and I'm the co-owner of TLC Tutoring Company. Uh, and I really just kind of want to pick up uh, pick up where Justin left off, um, because I really like the hopeful message that he was painting for us there. Uh, the reality is that the world is very confusing right now. Uh, it's very confusing as a parent. I'm a young parent myself, uh, and I know that the world is very confusing. Um, you know, I was actually recently told by a fifth grader uh, that I didn't need to worry because the, the media was blowing this all out of proportion because it was an election year. 
And it was a reminder that uh, the world is confusing on a lot of levels right now and that your students may be interacting with students that have a very different outlook on what we're going through right now and that that is you know a huge part of the conversation that we have to continue to have with our children. Um, but I also want to point out that, like Justin said, that there are a lot of us out here that are dedicated to helping, um, like Dr. Freyla and Dr. Furlow, uh, myself. We are all uh, in different ways trying to help supplement your child's education and make sure that you have the help that you need. Uh, and so that's where I want to start, is, is that the world may be confusing, uh, uh, but don't worry too much. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, my business partner and I often say that education, uh, like the analogy that Dr. Furlow used with health, is like a stool. Um, there are three legs and without all three legs, you can't really keep the stool up. And the three legs that we point to for education are time, effort, and resources. And all of those things uh, have been skewed a little bit because of the pandemic. Uh, the resources may seem more scattered, but they're there. Uh, effort may be hard to muster, uh, but we can do it. And when it comes to time, I think it's important to be thinking about where that time is spent. And I really appreciated both Dr. Ferrello and Dr. Freyla's comments on this because um, making sure that our, our physical and mental health are at the forefront of our consciousness. Uh, I really enjoyed that they talked a little bit about boredom, uh, thinking about what your kids are doing when they're bored. Uh, are they spending their time on social media? Are they spending their time learning? Um, you know, what is it that they're actually spending their time doing? Um, you know, we've all kind of talked a little bit about this, but you know, we all know that the rising social media usage amongst younger students has a host of negative problems. Uh, and if the children have way more time on their hands and that's the way they're spending it, uh, then you're going to see effects from that. And so, you know, we always want to encourage people to go find those resources, uh, the online resources like Epic, uh, you know, the entire National Archives and Library of Congress, almost every museum in the world have their uh, exhibits up online right now for free. And then there are also local companies like ours uh, that you can bring in to do supplemental academic work with your students. Uh, because remember that, you know, while getting physical activity and doing things like that at school are obviously important, uh, it's very important to be focusing on your academic work as well. And, you know, trying to get your student prepared to, um, you know, be competitive in a global marketplace, but, but also just to find what they're passionate about and, and to act on those passions. Um, and so, you know, what we've seen during the pandemic have been a lot of parents who uh, have a lot of questions. They're coming into contact a little bit more personally with their students' coursework, um, sometimes because they're having to, you know, to be more hands-on involved than they ever have before. And uh, we've seen a lot of parents that, you know, are worried, uh, not because of any deficiencies with our teachers or anything like that, but just they're recognizing how difficult it is uh, to shepherd a class full of 20 or 25 students to some kind of recognizable finish point at the end of the year. Uh, and, and I think that everybody is kind of recognizing that this really is a collaborative effort. Um, when we all talk about this, we all talk about guiding students through a pandemic. Um, it is a shared project. It is something that your student's teacher, uh, that your pediatrician, that uh, you know, therapist that your student can talk to, that your student's tutors, that we are all working together in kind of this shared collaborative project uh, to try to guide students through the pandemic. So, you know, I, as scary as the world can seem right now and as confusing as the world can seem, don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to talk to your student's teacher. Maybe, maybe you've not you know, traditionally been the parent that really creates a relationship with your student's teacher. Do that this year. I, I can't encourage you enough. Uh, you know, ask your pediatrician those extra questions. You know, take, take the time um, to ask for help because I think so many of us get caught up um, in feeling that asking for help you know, is a sign of weakness. It's like, you know, truly, it, it is a sign that you just care about your student and that you recognize that we all play a small role in trying to get them to, you know, to whatever that finish point is. Um, you know, we also do free community programs with the public library. Uh, when talking about resources, we do a free practice ACT program with the public library. Um, and we have traditionally had a bilingual homework help program that we're looking to possibly relaunch with the Boys and Girls Club. So keep your ear to the ground. Um, do not be afraid to reach out to folks like myself, um, you know, Justin, Dr. Freyla, Dr. Furlow, to ask about these free community resources uh, and the extra resources that you can put your kids in uh, if you want to. And, and that's, that's really my focus for tonight is uh, we're all being pushed into a situation 
and we have for the past couple of months, um, where we're this strange combination of very busy and have more free time on our hand than we ever have, right? And so what are your students doing with that extra time? Are they doing something productive? Um, which again, something productive can range all the way from running outside and getting a little bit sweaty, um, you know, to reading a good book or engaging in some kind of an online learning activity, um, maybe not so much Instagram, TikTok, uh, and all of the different social media platforms that we know are affecting the way that our children are developing and, and seeing the world. Um, and so all I can do is just encourage you to uh, reach out into your community, look for your local resources. If you're somebody that doesn't have students uh, right now, understand that this collaborative project goes way beyond all of us that are in the childcare industry or that have students. We all have a shared interest in the population that we are raising to be the adults of tomorrow. And so this is something that's very important is that, you know, even if you don't have a student, if there's anything that you can do to get involved in the community level, um, even if it's just, you know, donating a couple books to Justin so that he can get them in the right hands, you know, reach out in your community, see what it is that you can do to give back and, and don't be afraid to lean on the help that your community is providing for you. And that's all I have to say tonight. So thank you. Thank you, JJ. All right, we have a few questions from our Facebook audience. So I think we'll start with you, Dr. Furlow. Um, the first one is, at what point would you endorse a COVID-19 vaccine? And what concerns do you have around that? A great question. And I, I get that in my office a lot. Um, so I will endorse a COVID vaccine when I feel like it's been vetted to the same degree that the other vaccines that we give and feel are safe have been vetted. And the process is generally very spread out. And in uh, my office, we do a lot of um, participation in vaccine research, so we're very well versed in the process. Um, and it has been condensed, which doesn't particularly bother me. However, if it's cut short and we are not, you know, clear on side effects and effectiveness, um, if it's rushed, if it's a political process, I won't take the vaccine. I won't recommend that my parent, my patients take it. If I feel like it's gone through the full safety profile and that it's effective and it's safe, then I will take it. I'll be first in line and I will recommend it to my patients as well. There are some really good people in the public health arena and they will not recommend a vaccine that's not safe. And I feel very confident about that. Do you have any people that you look to, Dr. Furlow, um, that you could recommend that our audience just, that, that you trust? Yeah, I really do trust Dr. Fauci. I think he is an excellent public servant and a phenomenal physician and extremely bright. Um, there is a, a doctor up in uh, Philadelphia named Paul Offit who is a, a vaccine pioneer and he will always act in the best interest of the children of our country. And then Michael Osterholm as well um, at University of Minnesota in the SIDRAP department. Um, those are three faces that I fully trust and, be and, and believe that they will act in our best interest at all times. Okay, thank you. Uh, another one for you, Dr. Furlow. Should we still be making well child visits during this time? Yes, it makes me very happy. <laughs> um, but yes, we actually have not had a fall off in our well child visits at all in our office. I can't speak for every pediatrician in town. We have a separate building for wellness and, and we're not letting any patients in our waiting room and the rooms are clean between, between, between patients. And um, I feel really confident in our ability to continue to provide well child care, routine vaccinations, developmental evaluations, mental health evaluations, all of those things during this pandemic. Uh, with the flu season around the corner, how does a parent know if it's flu or COVID-19? When do you recommend that we take a child in for a test? So this is such a great question. And I actually woke up the other day to a headline from the Wall Street Journal saying, how do you tell the difference? And I was so excited to read it because I thought they had figured it out um, because we don't know. Um, I can tell you that we have a database in my office of the, the couple of hundred kids we've had with COVID, we have a all listed out of what their uh, symptoms were. And it is everything from my right leg hurts to fever, cough, congestion. And I, I, it, 
I could throw them all the names in a hat and pull them out and say that's COVID and that literally would be accurate. I, you cannot tell. And so it's the middle of allergy season. Those, those symptoms mimic COVID. So if you're concerned that your child has fever, cough, congestion, if you're concerned at all, bring them into the doctor because we can do the rapid tests on kids pretty easily. It's really not that bad and they're really accurate and um, it's a good way to know. That way you don't feel like you're putting other people at risk and you know, or yourself at risk. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Okay, Dr. Frela, we're gonna move to some in your arena. Uh, do you have tips for parents to combat the loneliness that's made worse for kids by the fact that we're all around each other all the time, as you mentioned, but parents are really feeling the, the need to work or to be present at work, and the children are just seeing the parents on the laptop. Like, is, are there phrases that we could use? Or I know you mentioned, like, maybe you could spend 10 minutes with your child before getting on the laptop. Yeah, um, there's, clearly, there's no easy solution. But one of the things that I try to do is set some boundaries first for myself. You know, um, I try not to have my phone with me when I'm really tuned into my kids. So I don't feel that desire to check email, to respond to the text. That when I'm with them, I'm sort of all in. Um, and that when I'm at work, I'm sort of all in work as much as I can be. Um, obviously, sometimes they mesh, but that there's some amount of time every day that my kids know that I'm fully tuned into them. Um, another strategy is to help narrate kind of what you're doing. So when our, our parents weren't spending 100% of their time focused on us either, right? But we could see that they had the checkbook out, and so they were paying bills, and that they had a letter out, and so they were writing grandma something, and that they were looking at a newspaper and getting the news. And so those things were sort of more defined so that they can see them. So sometimes I try to narrate to my kids. Um, I'm going to send these emails right now for work. I'll be done in about five minutes, or I'm about to call the plumber, or I'm looking up the question you just asked about grasshoppers so that they know kind of what my electronic device is, how that's functioning in the house right then, which helps them also scaffold their own ability to someday be able to navigate those devices, that they are an important tool in our lives and that they're not only for recreation and so that they can see me using that as a tool and also see me set that down sometimes and really tune into them. The other tip I would have is that having some brainstorming sessions with them of what they're gonna do while you're engaged in work, right? Mm -hmm. So is there, for little kids, perhaps like a sensory bin or a toy that can come down out of the closet when it's work time? Is there, um, you know, a particular TV show or something where you say like, we're gonna, you're gonna get to do this for 30 minutes while I'm totally tuned into work. We don't have to apologize for the fact that we have jobs, that we have other interests, that we are managing important things, that we have careers, that we earn money, that pay for our lives. Those aren't things that we have to apologize for for our kids. But we have to collaborate with them to make sure that everyone's needs are met throughout the day. Thank you, those are very helpful. Another one, Dr. Frela, how can we help kids who are too young for school but are missing so socialization? The big one. Gosh, that one's a big one. Yeah. Um, that's, it's particularly tricky too when you don't have siblings. So my littlest kids have siblings, and so I feel like that's that's part of that. You know, I think one of the things is to take kind of a long lens and that while they are missing socialization that throughout history, we were never this connected, particularly this early on. Universal preschool is a fairly new thing that I support wholeheartedly, but lots of children grew just fine with sort of being part of their family unit during those early years. Previous to that, even, you know, two generations back, kids were living on farms and sort of only a part of that family life during those early years. And so, I don't think that we're causing quite as much harm as we think we are when our preschool age kids are spending most of their day as part of the family unit. I think though that that does put more pressure on parents to feel like they have to engage. Um, that, you know, 
I almost never make dinner anymore without my child stirring something. We drop as many eggs on the floor as we make some days. Um, that folding them into family life and being a full participant in family life, even when they're not quite old enough to be, they're, they're helpers is what I like to say. If they're not actually helping yet, um, is important to make them feel included. That being said, all the screen time recommendations um, by the American Academy of Pediatrics sort of exclude the FaceTime and the, the ways that we can connect through um, video chatting. And so, you know, FaceTime and Grandma, can Grandma read them a book? Can you play, um, you know, a, a card game or something with matching of colors? Are there ways that aunts, uncles, caregivers, babysitters, um, those type of people can meaningfully contribute um, through the digital platform? Sending letters and those types of things can be helpful too. Also, kids are really doing quite well at masks. My two-year-old asks for his when we get out of the car. And so if you feel like your child is really missing some socialization, I would encourage you to try to connect with another family that has a similar level of cautiousness around COVID and let the kids do some um, playing together with masks on, throwing balls, hitting a ball off a tee and then chasing it. There's lots of things that we can do without being right on top of each other that does provide meaningful play for young kids. Thank you, Dr. Freyla. Uh, Justin, we've got some education questions um, for younger kids. Uh, here are two Zoom questions. Who would have guessed? Um, how do you help young kids who are learning virtually with Zoom overwhelm and screen burnout, especially if that's a required feature of their classroom? And then also, how do you help a young child stay focused during a Zoom meeting? Yeah, I think about this a lot um, because, you know, previously we were really trying to reduce screen time and suddenly the kids are on it so much. Um, one thing I know a lot of teachers have talked about is that it's just everything that you do in your classroom is kind of building expectations at the beginning of the year. So just really talking explicitly about those expectations and not assuming that kids know them, you know, so just things like, you know, is it going to be okay for the kid to eat a bowl of cereal in, in the middle of the Zoom class or not? You know, is it okay for them to wander off <laughs> out of the frame or not? Is it okay for them to stand up? Just kind of working through some of those things. And um, the other thing I would recommend is just kind of encouraging the teachers to maybe not have too much time on Zoom. I think sometimes teachers feel this pressure coming down from principals, everyone above them to kind of provide what looks like conventional instruction. And I know like for my son who's in fourth grade, he's only on from like 8.30 to 11.30, which is long, but they have a break in the middle. And then the rest of the afternoon, he's kind of doing these art activities in PE. So I would just really kind of be explicit with the teacher if you feel like it's just too much because we need to make sure that it's developmentally appropriate. Um, and then again, in terms of staying focused, I think it really is important that kids get a lot of breaks. And so that might be something again that you communicate with the teacher about. Uh, you know, there's a kind of rule of thumb that says kids can listen to someone talk for the number of minutes as their age. So a four-year-old should be able to listen to someone talk for four minutes. You know, a nine-year-old can listen for nine minutes. It's not realistic to expect a nine-year-old to sit there for 45 minutes and just listen. You know, I mean, it's different if you have small groups. That's something I've really encouraged his teacher, who's wonderful, to do more of is these little book groups. Um, and, and that's not the same thing as attention span, right? Like sometimes people talk about his attention span. I've seen a three-year-old focus on building a Lego world for two and a half hours. Um, but if it's not that kind of active mode where they're really in a conversation or in a smaller group, it may just not be realistic to expect a young kid to sit there and listen and stare at a screen, which is oddly tiring for some reason, even though we're not sure why for a really long time. Thank you. Those are helpful. Um, and JJ, I think this last one could fall into your realm. Um, someone writes, one of our biggest problems with our junior high student is focus. Uh, he has a hard time managing his time on his own, but that's what he's being asked to do. Um, how can a parent help focus without being over the child's shoulder, which I imagine is not appreciated past the age of 11? <laughs> yeah, um, this, this one hits very close to home for me, actually, because I was a teenager that struggled very, very hard to uh, pay attention to school. So I, I, that, that really hits home for me. 
Uh, and I also understand from a, a parent's point of view that this could be a very frustrating situation because you, you definitely don't want to be overbearing and push your kid, um, you know, into a place where they're going to be less productive. Um, but I, I think that, you know, kids respond very well to responsibility. Um, most students at that age have things that they're very passionate about. Um, I'm not sure what it, what it is for your student. For me, my band meant more than anything in the world to me when I was 15, 16 years old. I, I definitely thought I'd be playing uh, <laughs> rock music that I thought was going to be a lot more popular than it was uh, right now. But, you know, students at that age have passions. They have things that they really care about. And, you know, sometimes leveraging their attention in that direction can be the most successful way to, um, you know, get them to focus on the things that are a little bit more difficult to focus on. And uh, while time management definitely is one of those skills that is the hardest to develop, um, this, this is the time for them to really be focusing on that because um, it's only going to get more important from here on out in their life. And so while, while I know that that can be, um, you know, sometimes frustrating, don't, don't let yourself speak out of anger or frustration whenever trying to guide the student. You know, you, you definitely want to uh, approach it from as, as uplifting of a standpoint as you can. Um, but I, I totally understand that frustration. And I think the answer is just patience and passion, you know, find, find what it is that they're passionate about. Um, try to treat them with as much patience and respect as you can um, while trying to teach them that, you know, especially as they go forward in life, those things that they care about uh, can only be balanced out with, you know, the benefits of your hard work and you know, fruits of your labor, et cetera. Et cetera. So. Uh Justin, another one for you. I was wondering if you have just some thoughts for any teachers that are watching on how, I just feel like this is such a time of complete overwhelm. And, um, it, you know, so many teachers are heartbroken over not really getting to connect with their students in the way that they have always. I mean, you're a teacher of 20 years and just all of a sudden here we are. So I was just wondering if you could speak to to that and just any educators that are watching and how they might be dealing with this school year. I mean, I think a lot of it applies to what we talked about with parents about kind of just showing yourself grace and realizing you don't have to get it right all the time. You just have to get some of it right some of the time, you know, and that the most important thing is really conveying to kids that they're loved. And what I see right now is schools and districts really kind of burying their leads sometimes, like starting off with, okay, make sure that the kid is on at this time and here's the link and they're not doing this. And the first thing that parents want to know is that you see my child, you love my child, <laughs> you're dedicated to my child, right? And so we need to really make sure that we're leading with that. Like, I'm happy that I get to be your child's teacher. This is hard, but we're figuring it out, you know? Um, the other thing I think for teachers is that it's important to kind of really be advocating for yourself. I think a lot of teachers right now across the country feel like they're being asked to go into situations that are not safe, you know, and we've seen almost daily emails now about COVID cases popping up all over the district. And so I think you, teachers need to trust their intuition and really advocate for what they need to be able to go in and do their job safely, you know, because I, I've got friends already who have had to quarantine, friends who've tested positive because they've been asked to go in to situations that just aren't safe. I um, mean, then I guess, you know, the last thing I would say is that what's exhausting about teaching is also what's wonderful about it is the relationships. It's the time with the kids. And so just kind of going back to those basics, even if you are a teacher who's doing distance and trying to think, how can I build community? Um, how can I make sure I'm listening, not just talking? How can I give kids time to get up and move around? You know, so like for young kids, every 15 minutes on Zoom, maybe take a break, even just for two minutes, let them stretch or go get some water, or run around. Um, and even though in some ways this is really new, I think really we're going back to these really fundamental deep principles of what it means to connect with a child and show a child that they're cared for um, and always keeping in mind that really our job as teachers is not to cram their brain with a whole bunch of content, you know, kind of to go back to Dr. Frela's point, in some ways kids get a lot out of being with their families for kids who are home. You know, our job is to help kids live the lives they dream. And that's not just 30 years down the road, but that's right now trying to make sure that there's some joy and meaning in their experience of school, even if we're not getting in all the content that we would in a normal year. Hmm. Thank you. Um, let's see, it looks like we have come to the end of our questions. So I really just wanna thank each of our panelists so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate your time. And thank you to everyone that has been um, watching on Facebook. Um, we hope you enjoyed the program and found the information useful. 
uh, we will be sending the participants who registered an email with tonight's recording, slides, and a survey to help us improve our programming. If you did not register but you watched, um, please feel free to email us at the Fayetteville Public Library and we'll be happy to send you that link. Our email is kidsquestions at faylib.org. And um, just in case we still have some viewers, I wanna make sure to let everyone know that the library closes this coming Saturday so that we can move thousands of books to the expanded library. So curbside will still be open, but you won't be able to come in after this Saturday. Thanks everybody so much for joining us and we hope you have a great evening. Good night. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks. It's great to meet everybody. Take care. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I learned something from all of y'all. <laughs> <laughs>